on the screen for you to click. And now we hand over to our team of gynaecologists, etc. Um, now, I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested in all this. I, I, I was just talking to Wendy that uh, by sharing this thing means I, I, I get to come every week and I've learned so much in the last three years about disparate topics from uh, colleagues that I often walk past in the corridor and don't even recognise who they are until they present a grand round. I have to say that this is way below the diaphragm, so it's way outside my area of expertise, um, but I will desperately try to come up with a question whilst I'm eating my salad. So, uh, is it Wendy first? No, you start off. How can we go then? Hmm. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is going to be the agenda for the next 45 to 50 minutes. But before I introduce the speakers, a very difficult question for all of you. Please try to answer. Can you put up your hand if you have read, seen, or at least aware of the Marvel superheroes? Thank God for that, okay? So our own Captain America is Dr. McMillan. She is full of knowledge, tons and loads of clinical and surgical knowledge. Our anesthetist, Eddie Wilson, is Nick Fury. He starts off our mission, our surgery, and then just watches as the drama unfolds before him. <laughs> but we do expect an applause for him, from him when we finish difficult surgeries, and he does that nicely. I would love to be the Iron Man with all the gadgets possible for my laparoscopic work, but unfortunately, I end up being the Hulk. I just throw tantrums to get the work done. And the new kid on the block is Ian Sanders. Uh, he was our clinical oncologist. And together we are the Avengers, and we bring to you fight the fat, fight the cancer for the next uh, an hour, okay? This was just a backup slide in case none of you had ever watched Marvel superheroes. I thought I'll go over to Star Wars. Having said that, I'm, it's a completely different world, bariatric surgery, but we have Pradeep Patil uh, from uh, bariatric surgery from a different team coming to talk to us about what our future could look like. So I'll pass it on to Dr. McMillan. Thank you. So as Tom says, um, perhaps fortuitously, we're giving this talk on World Cancer Day. And I think the only shame is that some people therefore can't be in the audience because they're at other meetings related to World Cancer Day. Um, also to say we slightly overestimated our problem in the flyer. I don't know if anybody noticed the deliberate mistake. If our incidence of endometrial cancer had gone up by 57% in two years, the department would have imploded in that time. Um, but there's still a significant epidemic in endometrial cancer. You can see on this slide the incidence was relatively stable until the early 1990s, but in every decade since then, the incidence of is, has increased by about 30%. So over the last 20 years, the incidence of endometrial cancer has gone up by 57%. And that's uh, throughout the Western world, not just in the UK. And although there are other risk factors for endometrial cancer, the main cause for this is the rising rates of obesity. So if you look at this uh, Scottish Parliament information document, the SPICE briefing, which was published a couple of years ago, this has mapped the obesity epidemic in Scotland over a similar time period. And you can see for adults in Scotland, the rates of um, uh, being overweight have increased from just over 50% to well over 60%. The rates of obesity have increased from about 18% to about 28%. Now, if you look at that graph, it doesn't look necessarily that bad, and it looks as though it's starting to plateau. But if you look at the next graph, this is really worrying, and this is really impacting on us. So this is the waist circumference, the rise, rise in waist circumference in Scotland, and we know that that impacts more on the metabolic dysfunction associated with obesity as compared to the BMI. <coughs> And in the men, it's gone up, but it is plateauing. But in the women, the number of women with a raised waist circumference over the last 20 years has gone up from 20% to, over, to almost 50% with no sign of it levelling off. And why is this important in endometrial cancer? Um, well, 
the, the main reason is that endometrial cancer is an estrogen dependent tumor. Um, so postmenopausal women don't make any estrogen in their ovaries, but they produce androgens in their adrenal glands. They then get peripherally converted in the adipose tissue to increased levels of endogenous estrogens. So a postmenopausal woman's exposure to endogenous estrogens is proportionate to the amount of adipose tissue in their body. Over and above that, though, there's probably a role for insulin and insulin resistance because we know that it's not just estrogen-dependent cancers that are more common in obese people. All cancers are more common in obese people. And we don't totally understand the pathway for that, uh, but one of the postulated pathways is that elevated levels of insulin-like growth factor uh, alter intracellular signaling. For example, it might downregulate the P10 tumor suppressor gene, and the downstream effect of that is increased cell proliferation and therefore an increased risk of cancer. And as I say, this is not just uh, endometrial cancer. Sorry, this is a very busy slide. This is an article published in The Lancet about two years ago from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and this was looking at over 5 million British adults from the GP database, and it was correlating the relative risk of cancer against the person's BMI. So on all these individual graphs, the x-axis is the BMI, and the y-axis is the risk of cancer. So some of the slopes are quite flat, but some of the slopes are quite <laughs> extreme. You can see... Big correlation for renal cancer, for gallbladder cancer, but here for uterine cancer as well. Uterine cancer is the one that's really starting to go off the scale. And if we home in on that slide, you can see that if your BMI is increased to 30, the relative risk of endometrial cancer is tripled. It's times three. And from the same paper, so a BMI between 30 and 35, almost a three times increase, a BMI of over 35, almost a six times increase. And it's actually difficult to get the figures for the severe obese patient with a BMI over 40. But it's been suggested as long ago as um, 20 years ago that these women are probably running a 10 times risk of endometrial cancer. Now, when we consider that the background lifetime risk of endometrial cancer is about 3%, then we're looking at these women with a BMI over 40 of hitting a lifetime risk of endometrial cancer of 30% or one in three. And when we look at the BMIs of our ladies coming through labor ward or through gynae clinic, we're seeing a lot of women in this bracket who are going to be a huge risk of endometrial cancer in the future. Not all our endometrial cancers are estrogen dependent. Just to point out that we have another group of cancers, the so-called type 2 cancers. These are biologically different cancers. They're more aggressive cancers. They often have to be treated with more extended surgery, often with adjuvant radiotherapy and adjuvant chemotherapy, often in older women. But these aren't a group of women that carry a huge amount of comorbidity. But the vast majority of our cancers, at least four-fifths, are in are the so-called type 1 cancers. These are well-differentiated tumours. They're estrogen-dependent tumours, and they should have a good prognosis. They should be easily treatable and, indeed, curable by a hysterectomy. It's just the logistics of doing a hysterectomy in what can be very large women, and not just large women, but women who have very significant comorbidity in terms of insulin resistance, the metabolic syndrome, hypertension, diabetes. So a lot of perioperative problems that we have to manage. So with that, I'll pass over to Dr. Ragapathy, who's going to talk about the surgical challenges. So for low-risk, um, low-grade endometrial cancers, the optimal surgery is to remove the uterus, tubes, and ovaries. Sounds simple enough, and you would ask me, what is the fuss about then? Okay. So as gynecologists, we are set to fail. We have the bowels, the bladder, the ureter, all before us before we can reach the uterus deep, deep in the pelvis. And we are already set to fail, but with endometrial cancers, obesity, 
an increased abdominal circumference, there is a brick wall now. Increased adiposity, it's a nightmare to get access into the pelvic cavity. And the fact that increased abdominal circumference um, retraction is just terrible. The assistants have lots of soreness rather than the main surgeon. I suppose I'm lucky in that way. Okay. So traditionally, the procedure was done by an open technique. Um, usually, to get better access in obese women, we would prefer to do an up and down cut midline incision or a paramedian incision. Very rarely, we would do a transverse incision to get access into the pelvis. And then we would do the hysterectomy and uh, bilateral salpingoophorectomy. Why did we move away from this? These are the various complications that can happen with any hysterectomy but it's more so in an open procedure and especially in somebody with a BMI more than 30. The risk of bleeding is pretty high, wound infection, wound dehiscence rates. Uh, the chance that somebody has a venous thromboembolism following a major procedure like a hysterectomy and especially if they're obese and have had cancer surgery, it's almost about eight, eightfold compared to somebody with a normal BMI. It's questionable about the suboptimal surgery uh, but my fellow gynecologists will agree, occasionally we have had to leave the cervix behind because the cervix is the most difficult part to reach when we are doing a hysterectomy because it's in the narrowest part of the pelvis. And in obese women, we struggle to get the cervix out safely and we prefer to leave it <coughs> behind. This happens in a few patients. Again, laparotomies were associated with a prolonged hospital stay and long-term risks of incisional site hernias. Um, surgeons like us and hate us for it because we do give them clients for incisional site hernias, but then their clinics are perhaps overbooked because of that. Rehospitalization again is a major factor for uh, laparotomy patients. So that's a no no. And evidence for this was all derived from lots of studies and systematic reviews done which did show that laparoscopic procedure is far better than laparotomy in terms of short-term morbidity and uh, hospital stay. But then the question comes, are we justified in moving to a procedure just because it's got a better morbidity? Uh, what happens to cancer clearance? There is good enough reviews done which shows that the five-year survival rate is almost similar in both the arms and laparoscopic is not an inferior approach when it comes to cancer clearance. So we move on. Presently, we are offering a laparoscopic hysterectomy for all obese women with the endometrial cancers. The major challenge for us is this. Does anybody know what this position is called as? Trendelenburg, okay. So just remember the hurdles. The major hurdle is the bowels for us. So we do take the bowels out of the way by this position. So we gynecologists, we operate head down um, while the surgeons normally operate uh, um, in a more kind of traditional position, I suppose. But the major problem with this in obese women is there is a high chance the patient can slip because of the sheer weight. And we have had an incident uh, in a nearby hospital where the patient has fallen head down during the operation. It's a major risk, okay? Uh, and you can see the legs supported up in lithotomy. That again is a high chance of damage to the uh, lower uh, um, joints such as the knee and the hip when we are operating for a prolonged period of time, okay? This is a nightmare especially for the anesthetist, but I um, don't want to steal the thunder away from Eddie Wilson. That is their major challenge when it comes to uh, giving anesthesia for these big women for a laparoscopic hysterectomy. So let me just take you through the patient journey. Okay, patient sees us, is completely impressed with us in the clinic, and has come to theta. That's a happy team. I made sure I took the photo right at the start and not at the end, because we are not smiling, believe me. So that is the hospital um, um, bed, uh, the theta bed. It can carry a weight of 450 kilograms, so pretty good. And that's the help pillow. I'm sure Eddie will again speak to you about it. This is the gadget we use to prevent patients slipping when they are in Trendlandberg. It's called as a Huggy Vac. 
basically a vacuum system that sits snugly around the patient and doesn't let them slip back when we put them in position. We have the patient's consent to show you these images. So that's bariatric leg supports, and that's the hug you back completely enveloping the patient. And at, right at the back, you can see that this mattress is tight, uh, strapped to the table, and there are shoulder supports behind the patient. So when she goes in Trendlenburg, it doesn't allow slippage, and it protects the joints as well at the same time. And that's the team ready to go. We um, use budding system for operating on bigger women. Um, you sh you sh it's usually two consultants, and you can see Eddie hiding behind there. Okay, and we are set to go. So this was um, um, surgery that we have done last Tuesday. So, oh God, didn't mean to. That was not that quick. Just a bit worried because the uh, volume is not on. But anyway, so you can see the bowels all coming in the way. We have just taken the bowels out. That's the infundibular pelvic ligament. So the ureters we cannot identify in really big women because normally our ureters we can see on the pelvic side wall. So in bigger women, usually we end up opening up the pelvic side wall uh, to identify the ureter so it's not in our plane of dissection. It had wonderful music, I think it's gone. So that's the uh, bladder dissection. Can I just add, it's made to look easy, it's not this easy by the way. So the bladder is pushed down, the round ligament is opened up, and you can see further bladder dissection being done. That's the bladder being pushed down actively. And then these huge chunky vessels are the uterine arteries being coagulated now. We are using monopolar to open up the vault. It's the posterior cuff, so to make sure that the cervix is coming out along with the uterus. And then we go through anteriorly to do the same. And then the specimen is being retrieved. So that's the bladder. This is not the specimen that we removed from the laparoscopic procedure I have shown, but this was from another patient. Just to say that this was another uh, a lady with a BMI of 50, but we managed to remove that big ovarian mass. And again, thanks to my husband, he edited it so beautifully. So 20 hours later, this was the patient. So she has had the surgery last uh, Tuesday, and this was her uh, on Wednesday, just ready to go home. So we managed to get her video done, uh, which is not doing that anymore. You want to play off your mat, do you? Yeah. I had set it up. Oh, I am. I know. I'm trying to. Try now. You may have fooled the uh, technology here. We'll get that back again. Hang on a sec. Yeah. There you go. Oh. Damn it. Try again. I'm not entirely certain which Marvel superhero I am. Uh, trickster, maybe. There you go. Yeah. Oh, she's gone. Uh, I think you're fooling it by trying to play it through two different media at the same time. Bear with me. There's no volume. Yeah, it was, um, uh, 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 yeah. Okay, I could just lip sync for her <laughs> anyway. <laughs> she gave a nice. Try again. Let's see if that. So. No, I don't know what you're talking about. No. We'll make it available on the website. Oh, that's a shame because it was all uh, set so beautifully before we started. 
Anyway, she, it was just to show that she was ready to go home and she gave us a nice walk and a little dance as well and she had not needed much pain relief at all. So it's really worth it doing the patients laparoscopically and seeing them go home on day one, but lots of effort goes into it. So our surgical outcomes for the past uh, 18 months, we have operated in about 60 women. Most of them, almost three-fourths of them were uh, BMI more than 35. The average length of stay is about two nights. We have converted one patient to an open operation, and there has been a readmission with one patient. It was more a surgeon's anxiety, believe me. She just had gastritis, but I got all disturbed when I called her, so brought her back for admission. And there has been one um, near complication. The diathermy was pretty close to the ureter, so we had to stent the ureter prophylactically, but there was no actual damage. So we are doing very well. But then there are some problems. There is still change in the anatomical landmarks, which we have not been able to address. The umbilicus is the major port of entry that we normally use for our laparoscopic surgery, and this is displaced caudally for all obese women. So we still struggle to get entry. It's quite time consuming. It takes us an hour to do a hysterectomy for a normal BMI patient, two hours for BMI 35, four hours for BMI 40, and it has taken us a record nine and a half hours for a BMI 60. So right now we have put the cutoff at BMI 60. We are offering to women with a BMI 60. So we take regular uh, breaks and do that. But then it can lead to surgeon fatigue and theater team fatigue. There is lots of studies again to show uh, with laparoscopic ergonomics uh, that the surgeon who does uh, work on morbidly obese women does get a lot of musculoskeletal pain and needs to see the physiotherapist not covered by the NHS. So is it still suboptimal surgery? There's only one point of contention that high-grade cancers, there is some evidence to suggest that lymph nodes need to be removed at the same time as a hysterectomy. And we are not offering that for morbidly obese women at this point of time just because we cannot um, um, ensure adequate access even by laparoscope. So change is inevitable. What do I want the future to look like? The robot, I can see my clinical director there who has kindly come. We need the robot, Tony, okay? Very good evidence again to suggest that with the, uh, compared even to laparoscopic surgeries, robot surgeries give better precision for the surgeon and better cancer clearance and again less morbidity. So remember as gynecologists, we have all these set to fail, bowel, bladder, ureter, and now with obese women as well, but we'll, we still perform a really safe operation and we have happy customers. Thank you very much. It's the anesthetist now. Thanks, Kalpana. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Eddie Wilson, one of the consultant anaesthetists uh, in Nine Wells. I, I had a little bit of uh, wonder about what I should call this, so this is the title I came up with. And more, probably the most important part of the fact that, as Kalpana has already alluded to, this, this really, really is a team game. Lots of you will be familiar with sort of definitions of obesity. This is the World Health Organization one. And one of the things that struck me on, on, on looking at this again was I think most of us are probably in the same situation now that even obese class 2 I'm beginning to look at patients with a BMI of 35 to 40 and just think they're fine because it's just so commonplace now and I think some of the, the biggest challenges are uh, the kind of BMI of 40 or above um, there are risks involved in this and it's interesting. So, so, some of the patients have, have, have insight that there are increased risk, some of these obese patients, and, and some not. Um, I had one patient who was really very concerned about it, and as we were chatting about risk, and of course the risk, they were not sometimes that good at defining risk, but the, the risk for individual patients is relatively low. This lady eventually just said to me, and the gynecologist who I work with will know this story, this lady eventually said to me, if I was your mum, what would you tell me to do? 
I wasn't sure I was in a position to ever tell my mum what to do, but maybe give her a bit of advice. But mind you, so we chatted away, and I said to her, I'd say to my mum, have the surgery, that's your best bet to, to get your cancer cleared and cured. So we chatted for a little bit more, and at the end of it, I said to her, do you have any questions? And she said to me, just one, do you like your mum, she said. <laughs> So, so that's a patient who gets risk, and I think that's probably proper informed consent, which is, which is something that we try and do our best with, obviously. So what are the challenges? Just the mechanics, and Campbell has touched on those already, just associated with, with a very large patient, but also those associated with sort of comorbid, comorbid diseases that, that we'll come on to. And just the positioning, the required equipment, even just to get started in a case like this takes a long time. We get the patients to walk into theatre, to get up onto the theatre table themselves, position them, check the position. We have, we have a kind of standing joke that the patient will either be too far up the table for the surgery or too far down for the anaesthesia, and there's usually a little bit of give and take in that. But, so there are issues around just sort of general patient safety and, and also staff well-being, just moving some of the patients. Some of the potential complications of laparoscopic surgery were mentioned, but there are clear benefits that Calpin has touched on already. Um, and I think that, that these, these are genuine benefits. I think, I think this group of patients really does, does well out, out, of, out, out of this surgery. Anesthesia for laparoscopic surgery or anesthesia for the obese could be a talk in its own right. You'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to do that. Uh, I do have all afternoon as it happens, but you probably don't. Uh, and I'm an aesthetist. I like putting patients to sleep, but probably best that I don't put you to sleep. So, what are the risks? Just practical things like venous access. <clears throat> They're sometimes di potentially difficult. You know, as an aesthetist, we like a challenge, and we've got all sorts of ultrasound machines and all sorts of things. So, we can generally get venous access. Occasionally, our colleagues in, in radiology can help us out with the really difficult uh, patients as well. The ones I've highlighted in red there are, are, are maybe more specific for this. There are certainly potential airway difficulties. Lots of these patients, even if they don't know it, may well have obstructive sleep apnea, and certainly we, we have some who come in with that diagnosis, but probably some who are also at risk of that, and that has, has of some significance for the perioperative management. We've touched on diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obviously common, thromboembolic disease, and, and again, some of the complications of the laparoscopic surgery per se, or the, or the techniques, and I'll touch briefly on these. I do plan to be brief because we're obviously a number of us uh, uh, to, to talk today. So the things really to look out for if you're dealing with these patients or identifying them are those who, who are involved getting them ready for surgery, not particularly for this surgery, but, but the surgery in the obese patients in general. For the vast majority, of course, the risk is low, uh, and Calpinus figures have demonstrated that. The literature would suggest that those at higher risk are those with this kind of central obesity and the ones who've got the metabolic complications of, of, of obesity, the, the metabolic syndromes, the poorly controlled diabetes. But I think in particular we need to look out for those who, who may have obstructive sleep apnea, sleep disorder breathing, to use another title, and those at high risk of venous thromboembolism. But actually that's all of these patients. They've all got cancer, they're all large, they're all having relatively long surgery, but they do have the benefits of early mobilisation and, 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 and really, which I think is a significant benefit uh, compared to the open procedures. <clears throat> Identifying people with uh, obstructive sleep apnea, a questionnaire based on a relatively simple thing called the Stop Bang Questionnaire. Uh, I, I was slightly, on rereading this, was slightly concerned. Uh, a lady who knows me well reliably informs me that I do snore loudly. Uh, I'm aware of having daytime tiredness. Even with my winter coat, I don't think my BMI is more than 35. I'm definitely more than 50, and I'm definitely male. So I'm beginning to rack up the points pretty quickly here. Clearly for this group of patients, the gender question is always no, but quite a lot of the patients, if you ask them about this, it's always slightly delicate to ask a lady if she snores, but I think it, we probably do need to try and observe it. And just identify these patients that are probably even at slightly more risk of the, the perioperative complications. So I think this is a useful and really easy thing, and it's part of a single sheet uh, of the kind of key things of anaesthetising uh, 
larger patients that, 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 that one of the anaesthesia societies will, uh, uh, has online and are really useful uh, thing, things to look at. But I, I think this is a particularly important thing in these patients and may influence where we look after them or at least how we monitor them post-op and various things. So, help is at hand. Help, in this case, is a thing called the Oxford Head Elevating Laryngoscopy Pillow. Other head elevating laryngoscopy pillows are available. I think all of you will be able to see that uh, in terms of airway management and intubation, when we clearly have to intubate all of these patients, uh, the second situation just looks inherently like a safer place to be and an easier thing. And we've got lots of good airway adjuncts that make it, by and large, a pretty safe thing. But lots of it's about preparation, explaining to the patient. Uh, we pre-exigenate them for you know, a number of minutes uh, before we put them off to sleep. The, the, the obese patients can desaturate very quickly and become hypoxic very quickly if they're not well managed. And, and positioning of the patient is one of the absolute key things for this. So what do I see as the benefits? The patients really do see that they're, 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 these patients are anxious. They're largely aware that they are at increased risks. They know they've got a cancer. They're, they're actually now very focused that they want to have this done by keyhole surgery, as they would describe it. And for the vast majority of patients, that's the case. And as Calpin has said, you know, even with an average length of stay, that of you know, it's just much better than the open procedures. Their analgesia requirements are, are low uh, post-op. They'll occasionally need a little bit of IV opiate immediately post-op, but usually then on to oral analgesia. Uh, the surgical team are very good at putting local anaesthetic in, especially as I nag them to do it, if, they, if, they, if, they, if I think they might be forgetting. They'll do tap blocks, various things, and, and, and it's really good. We've, we've had minimal use of critical care post-op. The lady company described to I think, was the nine and a half hours or whatever it was. She did go to ICU post-op, uh, and given it was quite late in the day, I was really delighted that there was a bed in ICU. Some of my colleagues felt that my position as clinical director and working in ICU may have had an undue influence on that decision, but I'm sure that wasn't the case. But, but we don't need a lot of critical care use, and I think that's also good for the patients uh, and also good for the thing. We can mobilise these patients early, and given the risks of thromboembolic disease, I think that's really important. An early discharge clearly frees up beds in this hospital, clearly it frees up beds for medical boarders, but that's, that's a, different, a different matter. So just to finish off, I promised Carl and I would try and be brief with this and allow everyone else to say, as I kind of crust the old and he's just within a couple of years of hopefully retiring, uh, I'm not easily impressed. I've been really impressed by this. I think it's a really good service development. It's really good for the patients and a challenge for the anaesthetists, but, but we, we do have a really good team and I think it works really well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ian Sanders, for those of you that I haven't met, and as Calpina says, I'm one of the new kids in the block, which basically just means I haven't yet learned the skill of how to say no when I'm asked to do something. And I have to say, next time I have you sidling up to me, Calpina, fluttering your eyelashes at me, I might be a bit more hesitant next time. Um, although I do like being compared to a superhero, um, and incidentally, that's one of the reasons I went into oncology, to see if I could accidentally produce the world's first superhero in a radiation accident. But as someone that treats pelvic malignancies most of the time, it's hard to imagine what that person might be. Um, so when I was asked to talk about overweight patients and, and the oncologist's perspective, I have to say my first reaction was to say I really don't mind that much. And that's because, I don't. of course, we don't have to worry about nine-hour operations, surgeon fatigue, uh, anaesthetic comorbidities and whatnot. But then I engaged my brain, and it was quite clear there are implications that we need to think about and we need to discuss. So I um, just have a few slides, which I'll hopefully bring up. Bottom right. Or does that work? Go yeah. Bottom right to start the uh, start presentation. You'd think I'd know about technology as a yeah, yeah. therapy person. There you go. That one. So obviously we have two alternatives to surgery. We have external beam radiotherapy and brachytherapy. Um, first, I was just going to talk a bit about brachytherapy. I'm showing a, a ring and tandem applicator at the top left there, which I guess few people have practical experience of. But effectively, 
We insert these in theatre. There is a thin rod called a tandem, which is inserted into the uterus, and then this ring which goes round the tandem and sits flush against the cervix. And that allows us to have a channel to pass little radioactive seeds up into the applicator and effectively give a very localised dose of radiation from the inside. And to do that, we have a remote afterload of this machine. The bottom left is is one one that we use. Um, You can see these little catheters here, which come out of the afterloader, then are connected into the end of the applicator, which then means you can have a radioactive source basically sent down on a steel steel cable into the applicator for a pre-calculated length of time. Most people describe this as like the radium treatment, but it's not radium we use anymore. It's an isotope called iridium, um, which is illustrated here with some dimensions. But these are in millimetres, so this is a three or four millimetre pellet, so it's tiny. Um, now, in terms of the challenges of brachytherapy in overweight patients, well, it does require one general anaesthetic. It's only 15 minutes or so to get the applicator in, so it's nothing like what they do surgically, but it, of course it doesn't take the risk to zero. Um, patients are immobilised for 24 hours as soon as the applicator has gone in, and that's for the entire treatment. So in addition to the thromboembolic risk that I've written there, there's other risks such as I don't know, pressure sores and, and whatnot. Um, the applicator insertion is technically more challenging in overweight patients, and it's probably best that we go, don't go into the details of that. Um, Alternatively, brachytherapy with external beam radiotherapy, a much more commonly adopted treatment. Um, we use CT scans to plan radiotherapy, so we need to rely on having a very good uh, scan image because we use that basically to plan out all our treatment. And if you think about pure size, this is a diagnostic CT. That red line measures 50 centimetres. And I learned that the aperture of diagnostic CTs is around about 55 centimetres. So that's why you get this artefact at the edge. It doesn't mean they're squashed into the scanner, which some people sometimes think. It's more just that it's too close, I guess, to the, to the sensors. So obviously, if that was to be our image for radiotherapy planning, it causes problems because we're not getting a full picture of, the, of what the patient looks like. Uh, this patient happened to have a BMI of about 40, so it's less than some of the numbers we've been talking about in the surgical context. The planning CT, this is what we have here. So this is uh, a Toshiba scan. Uh, this aperture is actually 90 centimetres, so it's bigger than what they have in diagnostic CTs. I have to say the radiographers thought I was losing my mind when I started, when they came and found me measuring the, the diameter of the CT scanner with a giant metre stick. Um, the couch limit is 205 kilos, so that's <coughs> quite good, actually. I have to say I've not encountered a patient in recent years where they've been too heavy or too big for us to scan them, which is reassuring. Perhaps a bigger issue might be the width of the couch, which you see is quite thin. And um, I'll come on in the next, side, next uh, slide to see why that's a problem. So radiotherapy, some people will be aware of developments in external beam radiotherapy. It used to be uh, the standard treatment was a four-field pelvic brick, big beams coming in from the front, the back, and the sides. These days, um, treatments, basically, IMRT is intensity modulated radiotherapy, which is, is more precise, allows sparing of normal tissues. And more specifically, what we use here is called volumetric arc therapy. So as shown in this stolen picture at the top left, you basically have the... Instead of the treatment head just basically going to a fixed position, zap, move, zap, it's basically continually on going around a 360-degree arc like this. During that entire time, the little leaves inside the head are changing shape, uh, which sort of changes basically the shape of the beam, of course. Um, and also you can change the speed in some machines of how it goes around. So you basically you can get a much more um, varied uh, treatment, which is illustrated in this slide in the bottom, where you can see you've got lymph nodes treated in this sort of arc here. For comparison, previously you would have just irradiated the whole of the the tissue inside that box there. But despite these developments, the uterus is still a moving target. It moves often about two centimetres, certainly anterior and posteriorly, because of bladder and rectal filling. filling. So there's only so much precision that you're going to be able to get. Um, As mentioned, you have to have a stable setup each day that you're treating. If you're given five weeks of treatment, you need to be fairly sure that each day they're in a reasonably similar position. So probably the biggest problem from our point of view then would be if you've got big skin folds that are maybe are are mobile, uh, and also you mark, you put little tattoos in the skin at the front. So if that's moving each day you get treatment, you might be treating a different place each day. Um, And again, if the patient's uncomfortable because they're lying on a hard couch and... 
they've got excess soft tissue, then, then that makes it all the harder. Dealing with the toxicities of radiotherapy is worse. The skin toxicity is worse, particularly at skin folds, because you get basically get a build-up of dose in that area. Frequently, patients will get diarrhea, cystitis, and of course, that's hard to, harder to manage if you're functionally impaired because of obesity. Um, so just to, I guess, talk a little bit about the... the literature on the subject, basically as is the case for a lot of oncological uh, scenarios, there isn't any randomised data, that certainly that I'm aware of, that's, where you've had surgery compared with either radiotherapy or brachytherapy or both. So we're relying on multiple single centre um, experiences. Overall, surgery would suggest, by my literature search, certainly about a five-year disease-free survival, about 90%, which is obviously excellent. Those are UK you know, uh, studies as well, where you've got hundreds, if not thousands, of patients. Oncology CDs are smaller, and again, we need to be aware that these are select centres have got access to all the best kit. They're often European, US, so they probably have patients that are paying for treatment, and uh, so there's an issue about patient selection. And the best you can achieve then is around about 80%. I suspect it's less than that for, for most centres. So unfortunately, you have to hold your hand up and say that the surgeons win this time, often other situations as well, but we won't get into that. So the current advice that we would always say is that Surgical management of endometrial cancer is superior to what we have to offer, but we are, as ever, delighted to offer our services if you decline to intervene. And that's all I was going to say. I'm Pradeep, I'm one of the upper GI surgeons. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate you guys and Eddie on uh, setting up such a safe practice. Uh, I can say that on the background of having been involved in setting up a bariatric practice four or five years ago, and we've done about 200 patients safely with not a single one getting to ITU yet. But I think it involves a lot of team effort, a lot of patience, dedication, time, etc., etc. And I hope you guys carry on taking this forward. Okay. I'm going to try and address a slightly uh, different aspect of endometrial cancer. Where is that? There. So, after you've heard about all the good ways of operating, anesthetizing, etc., etc., these big patients with endometrial cancer, the question I'm trying to ask you guys today is, is weight loss the answer? Okay. Is weight loss the answer to most things? Probably, with the current ep epidemics that we're going on with. Okay. Before I answer that question, I'd like to take a step back, this is going outside the box from endometrial cancer. This is a very nice study published in the NEJM in 2007 that looked at 10,000 consecutive gastric bypasses over a period of 20 years. Okay and compared them to controls matched for age, sex, and weight. Okay. And what they found was there was an overall 40% decrease in mortality in the surgical group, mainly with a decrease in diabetes of 92%, cancer by 62%, and cardiovascular disease by 56%. Okay. Before I come back into the box, I would like to say endometrial cancer, especially the type 1 you were referring to, is most people will not die from the cancer. They usually die of cardiovascular problems. So we might be able to tackle both with weight loss surgery. Okay. What evidence do we have for endometrial cancer? You've clearly shown all the evidence, and I'm not going to go back to that, but as the BMI goes up to more than 40, the incidence goes up significantly, eight to 10 times, like you mentioned. And the big point I'm coming to is come to the bottom that says sustained weight loss significantly decreases the incidence of endometrial cancer. Okay. This is data has been coming out for the last five, six years now. Okay. The important thing is sustained weight loss. Okay. It's not just weight loss for a year or two. And the big question is, how do we achieve sustained weight loss? I cannot talk about any bariatric surgical or lecture or presentation without showing you the famous Swedish studies. I think you sent me a paper last week, which actually breaks this up into male and female, but I've stuck to my old slide. Okay. The top is the controls. All of us struggle with life. We go through winters where we hibernate, put on weight, and then summers we tend to lose them, and we're all struggling at our baseline weight. 
Okay. We tend to achieve this baseline weight around the age of 35 or 40. Most of patients with endometrial cancer are in their 50s and 60s. Okay. They are so set in their lifestyles. They're not going to change. Okay. And I'm, I'll come to what I mean by change. The important thing here is over a 15-year period, controls are not going to lose any weight. In fact, some of them put weight on. <laughs> okay. They keep undulating and they keep putting weight on. The only way, of course, I might be a little biased, but I don't think I am. The only way of achieving sustained weight loss over a long period of time is by interfering with their endocrinology or malabsorptive surgical procedures. What do we do in the UK? Or in fact, Scotland? Okay. Despite all the evidence going back 15, 20 years, we're still saying, oh, just listen to lifestyle change, do your dietetics, do your exercise, etc., etc. That's where we're going to be. Okay. We're not going to be anywhere here. So the only way of achieving sustained weight loss, I think, is by manipulating the hormones or the anatomy, whichever is safer or easier for the patients. Okay. So we've established a very safe bariatric practice in this hospital, doing more than 200 patients, sticking to nice and sign guidelines. Okay. But there is no mention or attempt to even mention uh, cancer as one of the possible comorbidities indicated in bariatric surgery. Okay. Thinking has to change. Okay. How long is it going to ch take to change? Good question. Okay. I'll answer that by the next slide. You said, talk to me about the future. Okay. I've just given an introduction to the talk, but I would like to go back 20 years okay, to try and give you a glimpse of the future. The famous Walter Porras said 20 years ago, that surgery was probably one of the best ways of curing type 2 diabetes. How long has it taken for us to reach that state now where you say, oh yes, surgery is a good option to treat diabetes. It's taken us 15 years plus just to recognize it. So for us to recognize that sustained weight loss is a good way of preventing or even treating different sorts of cancer, especially endometrial cancer, is probably going to take the same amount of time. Okay. I don't want to sound pessimistic, but that's what I think it's going to take. Okay? But in the meantime, I would like to say a few more things. We can definitely exchange our uh, expertise, etc., etc. And you said about the umbilicus. Okay? In a big person, the umbilicus is there somewhere. Okay? Most general or laparoscopic surgeons, in my words, are married to the umbilicus. Okay? But as an upper GI surgeon, I'm divorced from the umbilicus. Okay? I stay away from the umbilicus completely. So if you want to know how we get access in away from the umbilicus, or we go completely differently and we can def definitely share that experience with you. Okay, and hopefully make your operating a bit more easier. Okay, okay. Secret, get divorced <laughs> from the umbilicus. Okay, thank you. Lovely. Thanks very much to the, ho to the whole team. Um, if you are sneaking out early, please vote, Esther, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as you leave, uh, because the feedback that you give, although it seems all very simple, just five smiley faces, it's very valuable.